All right, here we go. Special edition of Knicks Fan TV. Today's guest, he's wore a number of hats and accomplished so much in the music as well as the, the media industry. He's previously previously served at the, as the chief executive for Def Jam Recordings, Soul Records, Stepson Music. He also recently produced Kaepernick and America, which debuted last year at the Tribeca Film Festival. And he's also a, a adjunct professor at the Clive Davis Institute of Recorded Music at NYU. He is Bill Stephanie. Bill, welcome to Knicks Fan TV. Thanks for joining us today. It, it is absolutely my pleasure, CP. Thank you. Absolutely, man. And uh, I was introduced to you by our, our mutual friend, a mentor of mine and a big fan of this show in, in Chuck D. And obviously we want to want to get to uh, to your connection with him later on. But yeah, that that's how I was connected to you, man. And and um, just a an honor and a privilege to continue to speak to you guys to learn more about uh, the contributions that that you guys gave to the to the culture because it was so immense. It was so immense, man. So it's an honor to to have you on and to give you your flowers, man. Oh, well, well, thank you. And it, it's good to still be around to get those flowers, number one, especially in, in, in hip hop. Yeah. Uh, number two, hey, if I, I had to start my own show, I'd probably call it Chuck Fan TV because <laughs> I'm, I'm the biggest Chuck D fan in the world. It started the minute that I saw him on the campus of Adelphi University when... Uh, I was, I guess, a sophomore, and he was a senior, and it's been a family relationship ever since. Absolutely, man. And, you know, the the three of us connect through this platform, through Knicks Fan TV, and, and through our love of the Knicks. Uh, take me back. You were a Knicks fan since you were 60 years old. Take me back to some, some, some of your earliest memories uh, of those days. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, CP. Um, I, I was that nerd kid who was a sports fan probably coming out of the womb. I, I grew up in a, a sports-oriented household. My my dad was a, a sports executive. He was a photo editor at Sports Illustrated, Ted Stephanie. And, you know, I was surrounded with sports media, boxing, baseball, basketball, football. It's the 60s. You know, I'm born in the, the 1960s, which I, I think really was a revolutionary time for sports culture in media. It's when we get wide world of sports. It's the dominance of Sports Illustrated. So, um, you know, probably my baptism into sports media really cultivated my interest in sports in general, especially as a New Yorker. I was born in Harlem, spent a little bit of time in the Bronx, and then the family moved out to Long Island, which is where I grew up, Hempstead, Long Island. So, uh, you know, diving right in, uh, you know, Knicks fan from elementary school, those first years uh, of Clyde, especially, and, and Willis Reed, um, watching what little TV existed at that point, black and white of the Knicks, and, <laughs> and also uh, listening to the radio. And I was, I guess, old enough to be conscious of the first championship. You know, 69 to 70, yeah. that, that great team. And then moving forward to 73 when I'm, you know, 10, 11 years old. And I'm, I'm really old enough to truly understand, you know, just the magnitude of winning an NBA championship, unfortunately, unfortunately the last one so far. Um, but yeah, it, it was just, you know, resonant you know, for me to, to be such a fan of Clyde and Willis and Bradley and the Pearl, the Busher, uh, Phil Jackson, uh, John Janelli, who was, uh, you know, the, the backup center. They, they were all sorts of wonderful players on that team. And I've been a fan ever since. You said you were a season ticket holder in eight since 80 or 80, 86, 80? got my first, my first public enemy money. Okay. Went production money went to a I think it may have been a 10 game package yeah in in 1986 and uh yeah you know um I, you know we have we have Ewing at, at that point um and and not much else I'm, I'm trying to remember who was coach it may have been Bob Hill at that point I don't know if it was Bob Hill or, or Hubie but when Patino comes in um about a year or two later 
with Mark Jackson at the point, that's when just the energies just become so Bomb much stronger. Squad. Oh my gosh. It was, those are great days. Yeah. I I incredible times, man. A young Patrick Ewing, a, a rookie at that time, young player, but it it's just unfortunate that, you know, the Bernard King Ewing tandem, we, we, we never were able to see that duo coexist. No, that, that was going to be an amazing team to, to have Bernard recovering from an injury that we didn't think was recoverable, you know, back then now, you know, of course it is, but, um, you know, to have Bernard local guy, Brooklyn guy come back to partner with, with Patrick and to have, again, Mark Jackson from Queens, from Southeast Queens running the point, doing those no look by, you know, behind my head passes to the yeah. both of them as trailers. Oh man, we were looking forward to it, but it didn't happen. Yeah. It was uh, your favorite player. Was it from that 70s team? Was it was it Clyde or, or Willis? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It was Clyde. Yeah. It was Clyde all, to the point where there was one day when I went into my mother's makeup bag <laughs> and I got out her eyebrow pencil and I went to the mirror <laughs> and I started to draw on sideburns <laughs> and the mustache at <laughs> 11 years old so I could look like Clyde at least for five minutes until she got home. Yeah. That that's hilarious, man. Clyde was a uh, he was an icon in, in those days. It's your generation, indeed. That's one player that oh, yeah. I, I wish I, I would have seen uh, would have seen live. Well, what's your what's your thoughts on the on the present day team? I I think they're doing incredibly well. I'm I'm so happy, and this is why I'm such a fan of of this platform with you, with Alex, JD, what you guys do, mm -hmm. is that you bring a a sober analysis you know, adults in the room for observing, analyzing, and criticizing the team. Uh, for the past, you know, who knows how many months before the uh, the winning streaks, you know, when you'd go online and you'd see these folks complaining, uh, trade Randall, uh, fire Tibbs, fire Leon, fire Dolan, bury RJ, things take time. And, you know, sports is about patience. It, sports is about delayed gratification. If you're a Mets fan from the be from the beginning of, of the team's existence, you know, it, it took seven, eight seasons before they became competitive on any level. At least that's what fandom used to be about. And I understand that it's a different day, technologies, different platforms, so forth, driving discussion, conversation, considerations, everything else. But man... You know, things do take time, and it took time for this team to gel, and now we're seeing the results of it. Yeah, they, they've they definitely uh, taken the, this fan base by surprise. Obviously, the, the Brunson acquisition has been great. Uh, seeing Julius Randle come around after a lackluster uh, third year with this team. The Josh Hart acquisition certainly has fortified the bench. You're seeing Emmanuel, Emmanuel Quickly's growth and development here. And, yeah, you know, as you know well, in, in New York, we are short on patience the the trauma from the old days always creeps up on us, whether it's yeah. the losing or or you know the, the the choke jobs or the the bad acquisitions. We're always looking for the shooter fall. So it can yeah. it can be uh, tumultuous at times, man. Yeah, but man, you know, we're blessed. Every game is a Broadway show. Yeah. You know, yeah. lights, camera, action, celebrities. It's exciting no matter what. So exciting that our opponents get excited, you know, when they come in to play against us. Yeah. But that's, but we're lucky yeah. in, in that regard. Um, I, I salute everybody, Leon, you know, management, uh, Tibbs. Um, I, you know, I must say that I was kind of a reddish fan and mm. I, you know, I, I wanted, I you wanted to see him. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I was. Yeah. And I wanted to see him uh, see him grow because they're definitely natural talents there. But, um, you know, management decides otherwise. And the proof is in the pudding for what they've been achieving, of course, until the last two games. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. Now, uh, an interesting Knicks connection that, that you have as a kid playing basketball in, in Hempstead, Long Island. You were, you were in part of the, the youth basketball programs uh, that was run by Don Ryan, who was Julius Irving's first youth, youth coach, youth, Julius Irving growing up in Roosevelt, Long Island, now right. right next door to Hempstead. And Ole Mills, 
who was the father of former Knicks president Steve Mills. Talk talk about your, your relationship with Steve Mills back in those days. Yeah, yeah. So so growing up in in, in Hempstead during those years, during the sixties and seventies, you know, basketball was like hip hop. You know, there wasn't hip hop yet. Mm. So the youth culture was really impacted by the athletics that, that we all adored and, and basketball was central to that. In addition to the Knicks, in the uh, late 60s and early 70s, the Nets were on Long Island. They played at a place called the Island Garden in West Hempstead, yeah. Long Island, before they went to the Nassau Coliseum. Um, so we had influence locally with having the Nets franchise as well. In fact, Louis Karnasek, the longtime coach of uh, of St. John's, was the coach of the Nets franchise during those years, and he'd conduct clinics in Hempstead for, mm. for young people. They'd give out free ABA basketballs, the old red, white, and blue basketballs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we'd get a bologna sandwich, a Nets T-shirt, <laughs> and you know we'd watch, and they'd bring the players in to to run the uh, the clinic so you know Hempstead was very much a hotbed and Steve's dad Ollie Mills was uh, the coach of uh, Hempstead high school basketball and also he co-ran the youth program in the town with uh, with Don Ryan who was uh, Dr. J's you know first coach uh, the doctor was born in Hempstead spent his early years in Hempstead, then moved to Roosevelt okay, and, and came of age um, uh, there. So, you know, we both towns do claim uh, the doctor as both towns <laughs> do claim Steve Mills. Steve Mills is from Roosevelt uh, as well, but played in the, the Hempstead system that, uh, that his father ran. In fact, there were scrimmages, even though I'm younger than Steve and his brother, Doug, there were different scrimmages where age didn't matter. And I used to actually play as a kid and get waxed by both <laughs> Steve Mills and, and Doug Mills. And Steve went on to play uh, in, in Princeton, Princeton, yeah, uh, for, for Princeton University. And then, uh, of course, he became a, a top NBA and sports executive, just a, a brilliant, brilliant guy. And his dad was, a, you know, a saint to, uh, to run those sort of, those types of, of of youth programs that that energized and and nurtured us you know more than anything else and it wasn't just uh basketball in fact he ran a program called carry the books as well as the basketball it was a summer program mm. that was run by him and and uh i think subsidized by the urban league mm. and it combined academics and basketball that, those were the lucky times mm. uh that that we grew up in on Long Island in Hempstead, Roosevelt, Freeport, Uniondale, just wonderful. Yeah, yeah, it's it's that's very interesting because as as Knicks fans, we only saw Steve through a certain lens and, yeah. and you're judging yeah. him based on the results. Everybody yeah, of gets judged on the results. A place as we should owners, right? But so yeah. it's just interesting when when I talk to you, I talk to Chuck about him just to hear the the human side, like who he yeah. was as yeah. a kid and and who you got to know growing up. Yeah, good good guy. Great, great family. His mm. uncle Charlie Mills was our high school principal, and mm. you know I don't think I accomplish one tenth of of what I've been able to do without having the support system with uh, leaders like Ollie Mills and Charlie Mills. Yeah, very interesting indeed. And once again, this is Knicks Fan TV, uh, CP the franchise. Here we're talking to Bill Stephanie. Now, Bill, fast forward to your college days. Uh, you, you get a scholarship, four-year scholarship to Adelphi University right here in the area. And uh, you, you start working at WBAU as the, the station director there. One, one of the shows you had was called Mr. Bill. But yeah. you, you had an interesting campus encounter with, with a young man named, named Carlton Rittenauer. Who had a lot of style, a lot of flair, who we would later know as, as Chuck D. What were some of your, your earliest memories of uh, of meeting and working with Chuck? Yeah, so the early '80s, you know, hip hop is is flowing through the tri-state area, um, especially core coming from the Bronx and Harlem, and for those of us in Nassau County, you know, we're ten minutes from the Queens border, and if you take the Throgs Neck Bridge from the Cross Island, you're about 15, 20 minutes going to the Bronx. So we're not far. Plus. 
were all folks who migrated from the city to Long Island, to Nassau and mm -hmm. Suffolk County, most of us. So not only are we kind of New York City deniz denizens by our soul and, and where we came from, you know, our cousins are just 10, 15, 20 minutes away. So whatever's happening culturally mm -hmm. in the Bronx, Harlem, Queens, Brooklyn, you know, makes it out to Nassau County, Suffolk County fairly quickly. And that's what happened with hip hop. So by the early 80s, uh, Nassau County, I think, had a, a fairly robust hip hop scene. Mm -hmm. And one of the great, probably the best DJ collective, the best crew was a crew called Spectrum City that was run by a guy named Hank Shockley and had all sorts of different members, including a great MC named Chucky e. D. So I was already a fan of the Spectrum City crew when I got to Delphi, when one day I see a guy wearing a Spectrum City silk jacket. And I couldn't <laughs> believe somebody so cool as a member of Spectrum City was at a Delphi University, the suburban college where nobody's cool. There, there's just no way. Why is he here? So I, I go up to him and I find out that he's a student as well and that he's a graphic arts major and uh, that, you know, he was familiar with my my uh, radio show. So I invited him and Spectrum up to the show to hang out. And that's where the, the partnership begins and the friendship begins begins and the brotherhood more importantly begins and he, he talks about how he chuck talks about how he always wanted to be uh in sports media and be the next marv albert and as as you told me you guys actually worked with on a delphi women's basketball team radio but providing commentary so talk, talk a little bit about those days so yes yeah, cp embarrassingly somewhere <laughs> there is a tape <laughs> of Chuck D that at that point Carl Ryder or Carlton Ridenauer yeah. doing a uh, color commentary <laughs> and unfortunately Bill Stephanie Mr. Bill doing play by play doing my worst Marv Albert impression <laughs> as we're we're covering the uh, Adelphi Women's Panthers basketball team mm. in you know going towards the the mid 1980s mm. uh, but yeah that that was the sort of variety of experiences that, that the two of us had together. Uh, so super interesting, man. So as you're you're at the radio station and you're building that out and, and later Chuck and his guys would ultimately end up at the station as well. You know, fan engagement is so big now as as everybody's launching their, their own uh, media empires. What were some of your earlier techniques or memories to, to foster that relationship over the radio with, with your fans? Well, having the partnership with uh, Spectrum City, mm. with um, with Hank, Chuck, and the, the crew, because they were party promoters. So we had a distinct advantage to have a street team already embedded within the crew that would put up posters mm. really throughout Nassau County, most of Queens, and even sometimes parts of the Bronx in order to uh, listen to the radio show. So for college radio, which in the, the 1980s, which, you know, you were lucky if you had five or 10 people listening to you throughout a, a, a given night during my show, during Dr. Dre, who was later mm -hmm. from Yo! MTV Raps, mm -hmm. but was also a student with us, Andre Brown, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we would get hundreds of calls. In fact, we'd break down the, the telephone system. We get hundreds of, of requests and shout outs even even way back then. So you know, we had the, I think, skill sets of organic viral hip hop from a promotional standpoint mm -hmm. that then drew attention to what we were doing on the radio. And then fast forward to um, the creation of Public Enemy. Talk about a little bit about that and, and the role that, that you played in, in forming the group. Yes. Yeah, so um, I, uh, you know, I, I, I do my four year bid <laughs> at Adelphi and then, uh, you know, move on to do some writing uh, about hip hop. I produced uh, an early hip hop video show called Word, the World of Rock and Dance mm -hmm. that uh, that Chuck was a part of. We, we also had um, a, uh, a comedian 
by the name of Steve O, mm. who uh, was our, our, our host, and uh, another comedian, Steve White, who people can see in movies like Do the Right Thing, mm. who's from Roosevelt, mm. um, who was part of that that video show. So I was doing a whole bunch of things. Mm. I was offered a, a sale job at a local um, FM adult contemporary radio station that uh, you know provided a pretty good salary for a 21, 22 year old right out of college. But I, I turned that down to work as one of the first executive, not first executives, first employees mm. for uh Def Jam recordings, uh, Def Jam at that point, co-founded by Rick Rubin and Russell Simmons mm. at LL Cool J had the beastie boys and they were growing speedily growing a, as a label. Uh, Rick, fell in love with Chuck's voice and wanted to sign Chuck to the label. Chuck had already put out a single that didn't do much. And as you, you said early in the interview that uh, Chuck wanted to be in media. So yeah. He wanted to, uh, to be uh, a, a personality, great voice, great mind, great personality that he was a natural and he was perfect. But uh, you know, Rick was incredibly insistent and sort of, you know, intimated to me that, uh, you know, unless we sign Chucky e. D, you know, my job will be in jeopardy. <laughs> He's my college classmate. He's one of my best friends. You know, what's the matter with me? And this is after we had the success of selling 4 million Beastie Boys albums. Wow. We had the success of selling millions of LL Cool J albums. Yeah. We're one of the top labels, the top young label in the, uh, the business at that point. But that's how much Rick wanted to, uh, to sign uh, Chuck. So sat down with with Hank and Hank Shockley and Chuck D and and we came up collectively with the concept of in in essence melding a political punk rock group like the Clash along with the world's best rap group at that point which was Run DMC. Mm -hmm. So in essence that's the uh, basis for creating Public Enemy. And as as you as you said Rick Rubin said if you don't sign Chuck you're fired. So oh yeah, did, man. I you know I I, I guess I, I would have been out of there, but uh, you know it, it, he was right at the end of the day. But it's actually Dr. Dre mm. um, from Yo MTV Raps, Andre Brown, who brought the tape to Rick Rubin mm. that Rick heard uh, of Chuck, and Chuck was amazing. DMC from Run DMC was a huge fan of Chuck a, as well. Mm. He served as an ambassador to uh, Russell and Rick for it chuck on behalf of chuck and you know the rest took care of itself it's just so interesting and as chuck chuck puts it you know he he wanted to play the background and, and just do his thing and and now yeah. over the years they become a a global phenomenon and, and he's considered one of the, one of the greatest of all time that's just an incredible story rock and roll hall of fame um obviously he's been uh getting kudos for his documentary series mm -hmm. that, that he produced in association with the uh, BBC for PBS. It's, it's absolutely, you know, fantastic yeah. and, and comprehensive, but Chuck, you know, in addition to being a great musician, um, great lyricist mm -hmm. thinker, you know, Chuck ha has the, the, the personality of one of the, the great leaders mm that we've had politically and socially. He has, you know, that that King Malcolm thing, you know, in his soul, which is mm. help him endure, you know, I think in 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 many respects. Mm. That people like Chuck, uh, you know, they they come along, you know, once in a lifetime in my view. Does it does it bother you now the state of of where things are with the music just in terms of it just seems like at at the main stage the substance is lost, right? Yeah. Those guys are kind of put on the back burner and it's, it's just, the message is, it's just kind of lost in, in, in the mainstream of the music. Does, does that bother yeah. you or someone who was, was kind of at the forefront, a, a pioneer back when, uh, you know, protest music, political uh, inspired music was, was, was in, that was the end thing. I, I wish the music and the culture possessed today the variety that we were blessed with, you know, at, at the beginning and, you know, going through the eighties towards the, uh, the early to, to mid nineties to have a Bismarcky humor, you know, to have a flavor flave 
humor, mm -hmm. to have the fat boys humor, mm -hmm. to have Houdini romance, to have the Beastie Boys punk rock, to have public enemy politics, to have Big Daddy Kane smooth, you know, in a Barry White, Don Cornelius way, mm -hmm. all bringing it to hip hop. We had incredible variety to have you know the the insistence of Roxanne Chante and Roxanne Chante would win all of these rhyme battles where she'd go off the top of her head mm -hmm. as a teenager that I I don't feel that the elements that made hip hop so sticky you know just so right. unique as as a form of expression I'm not sure that we've been able to retain it but you know i also don't want to be the old man yelling at the clouds either yeah because you know i'm you know i'm at a different point in my life but uh yeah i i i have direct concern about music in general and how we position and accept you know music today versus what it was when i was uh you know in my teens developing as a musician and and as a DJ, I, I loved hip hop. I loved Earth, Wind, and Fire. You know, I, I love the Beatles. I love Led Zeppelin. I love Roberta Flack, Donny Hathaway. All of the variety of music that that folks appreciated some years ago. I I, I don't see the same sense going on right now. I I could be wrong. Yeah. Yeah, likewise. Likewise, man. And once again, this is Knicks Fan TV, uh, CP the Franchise here, and we're talking to Bill Stephanie. Uh, Bill, along the the road, uh, as as the rise, along the rise of, of Public Enemy, um, you you meet an aspiring filmmaker, an established filmmaker at the time, and also a diehard Knicks fan, longtime season ticket holder named, named Spike Lee. How did that, uh, what was your first introduction to Spike Lee? So, um... Shortly after the success uh, for uh, for Def Jam, uh, Spike comes to the Def Jam offices to meet with Russell Simmons to talk about potential opportunities for him directing and producing videos for uh, for our artists. So, um, uh, as I remember, Russell sort of kept him waiting for a bit, <laughs> um, like for a long time, mm -hmm. and I'm sitting at my desk. And I see Spike there and I'm like, hey, you know, I know who you are. And, you know, I, I was like De Niro. I know who you are. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I go up to him and I say, hey, man, you know, I'm I'm aware of your work. I hear that you have an independent film coming out mm. named She's Got to Have It called She's Got to Have It. Uh, my friend Nelson George, great writer, pro producer, thinker, and the man who really connects us all still does to this day. Mm was part of the support system for Spike making She's Gotta Have It. And he had told me about the film. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, hey, man, I'm already a fan. And I want to tell you about this project I'm working on. It's a political rap group called called Public Enemy. He mm -hmm. said, cool, you know, keep me, you know, posted on it. Mm -hmm. Spike goes on to success with uh, She's Gotta Have It. I send him Public Enemy sweatshirts when... um when folks watch the film School Days, mm. there's a scene where Branford Marcellus, who's one of the students in the uh, the fictional uh, HBCU that's featured in uh, School Days, mm. he's wearing a Public Enemy sweatshirt. It's the sweatshirt that I sent Spike, you know, <laughs> shortly after yeah. uh, our our meeting. Mm -hmm. So uh, we stayed friends, and then there was one day when he calls me up and says, "Hey, I have a script. Uh, I want you to check it out." And in Spike way, mm -hmm. I want you to check it out. I want you to check it out. So, you know, uh, what is it? Uh, it's called Do the Right Thing. It's about the hottest day in Brooklyn when things just jump off, man. They jump off. And I said, all right, cool. Bring it over. So at that point, I'm living in Brooklyn, Fort Green Clinton Hill section of Brooklyn. Shout out to everybody there. <laughs> um, Spike also lives there. He's almost like the mayor yeah, of yeah. the town at that point. Uh, gets on his bicycle rides eight blocks up to my apartment, drops off the script, and it's the script for Do the Right Thing, one wow. of the greatest films yeah. ever, ever made. It says that he wants Public Enemy to create this this theme you know, that will sort of operate as a Greek chorus driving action throughout the film. So he, he first wanted us to use 
part of the uh, the Negro National Anthem, Lift mm-hmm. Every mm-hmm. Voice and Sing, mm-hmm. th- th- and you know, when I presented that back to uh, Chuck and the production team, they took the cassette that Spike had given to me of Lift Every Voice and and sing and threw it at me. <laughs> um, so, and they basically said, "Let let us go into the lab and we'll take care of it." Yeah, and that's where Fight the Power, you know, comes in. And you know, talk about acing the assignment. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it 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 doesn't get better than that. And then we brought back Branford, who also lived in Fort Greene, Clinton Hill, a block away from me. Wow, to to come in and and put some wonderful sax lines, some Ornette Coleman, Coltrane like things on the remix. And it was just a great opportunity when we were shooting the video for do the uh, for fight the power in in Brooklyn in Bed Stuy. Um, it was actually during a Knicks playoff game. Wow! I think yeah, I think it was it was April. I think it was Knicks first Detroit, ah. and I had a small little sort of transistor TV. I don't know mm-hmm. if folks might remember that you could get these small <laughs> little Panasonic <laughs> yeah, TVs you that you put. Yeah, three AA batteries, yeah. and, and you could watch. And I, you know, I'm watching the, the game, and Spike's coming back to me. What's the score? What's the score? <laughs> you know, so, yeah. And we were able to to go on and work on clockers to, uh, yeah. together, and uh, uh, you know, so many uh, other films and in, in, in projects. And he remains a good friend. That's a, that's an incredible story. So it must have been many takes for for an iconic video because uh, you know you and Spike are checking on the score of a, of a of a critical playoff game. Oh, you're not stopping Spike Lee. You know, <laughs> e- even though you know this revolutionary act is happening, the creation of the fight the power video and Reverend Al Sharpton showing up to Wanna Brawley, yeah, thousands of people, so forth. Spike still had to know what the score was. Yeah. Incredible, absolutely incredible. You know, fifty years of hip hop, Bill, still a baby in in, yeah. in its infancy stages. But as you're you're coming along, you you start up one of the first hip hop stations at, there at at uh, at WBAU, the rise of Public Enemy. You're you're rising up the ranks at Def Jam, the first president, the first president of Def Jam. Like, did you did you have the foresight to see that? this was going to be be a global phenomenon crossing over no. you know throughout the culture permeating throughout the culture could you have seen that at the time no 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 and and, and i think that's what makes it all so special that from the beginning from you know those who launched everything that that connects to what we do today culturally you know the the cool hercs the the grandmaster flashes the africa bambatas uh you know so, so ds grandmaster grand mixer dst mm. um there are, are are so many folks who didn't think about money opportunity all they were trying to do is is create party time man they were mm. trying to create just safe cultural spaces at a time of surrounding destruction in in the Bronx in Harlem you know the kids figured it out mm. on their own and 50 years later the uh the elements of what they created what they developed that was just so natural and so profound you know it still resonates today to the point of what we discussed earlier do i think it resonates to the same level with the same sort of spiritual and soulful connection mm. that that hip hop had in the streets where you, if you heard good times in 1979, you know, going by your window on a boom box, you wanted to rhyme yourself, even if you couldn't <laughs> like me. Yeah. Do we still have those elements? Uh, 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 you know, I don't know. It's mm. such a different world because we have the phones and, and everything else. We communicate so differently. Um, hard, hard to say, but it's amazing that the elements, the basic elements of hip hop and rap have with, withstood the test of time from the boombox to the smartphone. Absolutely, man. And um, during your during your tenure as president of Def Jam, was there who's who's the one that got away? You, you had so many, so many, you know, legendary Hall of Fame talents: LL Cool J, the Beastie Boys, Public Enemy. 
Uh, who who was the one that got away during your time there? Um, you know, not too many from uh, from the Def Jam standpoint. Mm-hmm. I can move forward later mm-hmm. um, when I did Soul Records, mm-hmm. you know, and partnered with Hank Shockley. Mm-hmm. Um, we were trying to work with some local rappers from Uniondale, mm-hmm. Long Island, who uh, later were called leaders of the new school. So um, uh, Busta Rhymes, Charlie Brown, Dinko D and Milo, um, we were working to uh, to try and sign them, but that that didn't work out. But you know, local success and you know Busta is one of the greats uh, of all time. Yeah. When I did Steps on Music, um, I I had a uh, a guy who worked on my staff, who also was friends with and was serving as the promotion man and kind of manager for a group of MCs from Staten Island. Mm. So in my back office, I had this guy, Michael McDonald, who was my employee. He has these white label copies of, of this song called Protect Your Neck that he's you know sending out on his own. And I said, yeah, I don't worry about it. Yeah, it's another label. And these are just you know kids from Staten Island. You know, There are about 20 of them when they come into my office. <laughs> You know, I, I don't have the ability to manage or deal with any of this. I'm sure there'll be some label that'll take Protect Your Neck to the next level. It probably won't be me, and we know how that turned out. <laughs> oh, man, interesting indeed, man. Definitely one of my favorite groups in the Wu-Tang Clan, no question about it. Yeah. And uh, yesterday, we're, we're recording this on, on March 10th, uh, March 9th, uh, we we commemorated the the passing of the notorious B.I.G. Um, what were your earliest memories uh, of him back in those days? Boy, do I have a very early memory. So, um, as I said, I lived in Fort Greene, Clinton Hill, Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. I lived. Um, my first address was seventy six St. James Place. Uh, Biggie's address is in the two twenties St. James Place, mm-hmm. so he's down the block. So I used to, coming back from um, the offices, you know, wearing my Def Jam recordings jacket, which, you know, folks love to see at that point with the big Def Jam logo with the uh, the turntable arm on it. You know, it was a cool thing to wear. So I get off the A train to go back to my apartment on St. James Place when I, you know, I saw these young dudes who were on the corner of Fulton and, and St. James. And, you know, they're not playing hopscotch. <laughs> You know, they're not playing Skelly, you know, <laughs> it's just like, all right, okay. All right. And we just get back to my apartment and, you know, a couple of them would yell at me when they'd see the jacket. Yo, Mr. Def Jam, yo, Mr. Def Jam, we want to talk to you. Like, no, I'm going to get back to my apartment because I'm going to get back to my apartment. Yo, Mr. Def Jam. And as it turned out, that crew was, you know, as we refer to today as, as probably the junior mafia and Biggie was one of those uh, those young guys who yeah. was yelling, Mr. Duff Jam, right? <laughs> um, yeah, so that's my earliest memory of a teenage Christopher Wallace. And then later on, he'd show up at, at some of our parties for, for Stepson. We had um, a, a wonderful vocalist by the name of Miss Jones, mm-hmm. who's mm-hmm. now a radio person, now, who's now a radio personality mm-hmm. in her own right. Fantastic, but she's a great singer. We had a big hit song called Where I Want to Be Boy mm-hmm. with her. And... Uh, at one of the parties, uh, there's Biggie, you know, right there, and you know, d- dapping him up and, and everything else. So there, there was that connection. During the '90s, I served as a as a political pundit for uh, MTV and MTV News. I was sort of like, you know, their their consultant when something politically went down with mm. Tupac or you know a- a- anything else. Mm. So right after, literally hours after uh, Biggie was shot, and this is on YouTube, uh, mm. MTV News, Abby Kearse, who was one of the lead reporters, dynamic reporter for, for MTV, uh, comes to uh, uh, my house in, mm. in Brooklyn with a crew and uh, interviews me and, and Nelson George mm. about um, what had happened. And you know, we couldn't believe it was happening again because we had just gone through everything with, with Tupac and now yeah. to see you know rappers and, and and MCs leaving us on the regular 
way uh, too that soon, man. It's just gotten worse. Yeah, yeah. You know, going up through Nipsey to PNB Rock um, just is is depressing and deflating. Yeah, no question. Uh, you know, especially Nipsey's passing. That one hit me as hard as as Biggie's passing. It was just one of those well, things. Yeah. Biggie's passing, like I knew exactly where I was. I remember listening to Angie Martinez uh, in the afternoon. Yeah. I think it was like a Sunday. I won't say it was a yeah. Sunday. It, it was no, yeah, no CP. You got it on point. It yeah, was a Sunday. It was a Sunday, and I remember because you know you don't have Twitter, you don't have anything, so no, everything no. you're getting is off of the radio, maybe even TV. But I I just remember that day. It was such a solemn day. And yeah. just unfortunate. And the same thing with, with Nipsey Hussle, because I just felt like his rocket was just about to take off um, in, in terms yeah. of his contributions to the culture. So just uh, really, really unfortunate, man. Yeah. 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 Really. Um, you know, during his funeral, um, I, I think it was said that uh, that Nipsey Ermias was the valedictorian of his middle school. Mm. And, you know, at, at that point, you know, you know, talk about deflation. You know, I just sat back and said, you know, how how many kids who are valedictorians in middle schools, junior high schools or high schools in suburban communities lose their life to gang violence? Mm -hmm. Probably never. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in, in our communities, it, it becomes something that's far too accepted. Yeah. Yeah, true, true indeed. What what do you think the the labels? What responsibility do you think the the labels have in, in a, these that's situations? A, that's that, that's a good question. I, you know, they they bear some some responsibility, but we're also and during a time where you know you can upload to SoundCloud, you can put stuff on TikTok, on Instagram, on, yeah. on Facebook, on YouTube. You don't need a label, and many of these these artists do not have labels initially anyway. So we are living by way of technology in the most independently driven time of music distribution ever. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to, for those of us who might think that somehow the labels should be uh, in, in some way, shape or form uh, editing or, or controlling uh, what the artists are, are are doing, much of what they establish mm. happens well before they get near any downtown or midtown New York office or you know, office out in Santa Monica or Universal City in California. Uh, that's certainly a fair point. And uh, this is Knicks Fan TV, CP the Franchise here. Our special guest is Bill Stephanie. And, and Bill, fast forward uh, after the Def Jam days, uh, you became a, a media consult, media and uh, consultant and advisor at ESPN. What, what was that experience like for you? Yeah, that that was cool. Um, I connected with Justin Craig, who was the uh, program director of of the station, and, and of uh, of just the the collective mm -hmm. of uh, of ESPN Audio and ESPN New York. Mm -hmm. um, in around 2015, and uh, you know, I, I got to work with some cool people. Uh, with Stephen A. Smith, Michael Kay, Peter Rosenberg, uh, Howie C. and and Gerald Brown from the uh, the Bottom Line yeah. Sports Show, um, Bill Daughtry, who I had been a fan of when he's doing uh, updates on the MSG yeah, Network. Yeah, yeah. Uh, really, just wonderful people. And then um, for uh, as a special for uh, African American History Month, Black History Month for the two years that I, I worked with them. I'd come up with this idea that, and you know you know this as, as well as anybody, CP, mm. that when you attend um, a, a Knicks game, you look around, you say, well, in the, the first 10 rows, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm seeing all of these bankers and investment people mm. and, and billionaires that there's gotta be you know, in, in the first 10 rows of every Nick game, probably a trillion dollars worth of managed money mm. you know, by virtue of the folks who control the, those seats. So what if we started to bring those folks together in a room with you know, entrepreneurial folks from sports, the mm. Steve Millses of, of the world, mm. um, or Stephen A. Smith a, as well, folks with great minds, great thinking, who also think about the community as well what if we all put them in the room and just network to think about ways to collect capital and money and resources 
to build our community. So I, I created this project called Changing the Game in collaboration with ESPN New York. And, and we had two uh, wonderful events in, in 2016 and 2017. So those were the sorts of things that, that I did during my wonderful time there. Uh, that, that's, that's excellent. Excellent accomplishment. Um, when you look at the evolution of sports media, it kind of started, obviously you, had, you, you have your broadcast and, and your, your legendary broadcasters, the Mars, the Dick Enberg, so on and so forth, and the Howard Cosells and so on and so forth. But uh, from a from a analytical view, you the, the sports talk, it was, you know, for me, it was Mike and the Mad Dog. Of course. And then it just seems like all of the platforms now on TV was, is kind of like a, a carbon copy of that, whether it's First Take, yeah. it's Skip yeah. and Shannon, it's, you yeah. know, whatever, Colin Cowherd. It's kind of almost like a, a derivation or a spinoff of, of, uh, of Mike and the Mad Dog. Um, now you have podcasters uh, like myself. Uh, the players are now jumping into the fray. J.J. Reddick, Draymond Green. Uh, so what do, you, what do you think about that, that evolution now uh, to where the sports media landscape is at, at present day? It's like hip hop that we didn't know that when uh, FAN begins in the the late eighties uh, with like Jim Lampley mm. and Dave Sims and, and Ed Coleman. And I'm forgetting the guy who cursed all the time who they brought in from Cleveland, who was there for like a year, <laughs> um, who was supposed to be the big star. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, who knew mm. that it would turn into not only this, the success of FAN, but then, you know, it, it just goes geometrically to everything that, that you just referenced mm -hmm. from ESPN to, to Fox sports, to all of the, the, the podcasters to just, you know, so many that, uh, that were birthed by, I, I guess the, the great concept, which was, we're all fans. Mm -hmm. We love talking about sports following sports so why not turn that into an industry that drives revenue and boy what it's turned into yeah it's incredible and you know i, I love the fact that you could really carve out your own lane uh, because the barriers of entry have been lowered They're, it's basically non-existent and you have your phone you have a camera on your phone you have a microphone on on, on your phone and you can pretty much go and, and launch out your platform uh because when you look at the the established platforms, the ESPNs, the Fox Sports, and so on and so forth, there's only got so many spots. There's only yeah. got so many spots to crack. Yeah. And give credit to Stephen A. He he's been on the grind for for decades, and and uh, you know where he is right now is is well deserved, underpaid, if if you ask me. But I think that, you know at the independent level, uh, there there's there's room for everybody. There's room for everybody to carve out their lane and build their community. Yeah, yeah, he's he's a phenomenon and and a force of nature and and probably you know the greatest along with Mike and 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 Christopher. Mm -hmm. Um you know one of the the greatest sports personalities that we've ever had. Uh, you know his ability also to have bombast humor. He's um derivative to an extent of of what Howard Cosell was. You know, for many of us, especially for me in in the uh, in the seventies, but yeah, he's he's uh, he's just stunning. And uh, and I said this to you before we started. I, I I'm amazed at the success of Nick's fan TV. You know, it it just you know to see. And I the the other day, I forgot which day it was when you guys hit 6,000 on the oh, chat. 60, oh, yeah, yeah, six, almost 6,000 people, almost 6,000. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, and I'm like, I said, this is amazing. Yeah. But also, I, I, I would say part of, of your success pro it could be attributed to the lack of consistent talk and coverage about local basketball mm -hmm. on the existing you know, regular platforms like 98.7 and, mm -hmm. and FAN. I've always thought they gave basketball short drift. Yes, I know baseball, huge baseball town, huge football town. Yes, we have to talk about the Yankees first and then perhaps the Giants and then the Mets and and then the the Jets, you know, if you're mm -hmm. tortured mm -hmm. to, to, to do so. I'm a Jets fan. Um, but Knicks Nets, you know, not, not so much. Hockey too yeah, is, yeah. as well. But um, 
a void needed to be filled. And man, have you done an incredible job filling that void. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And yeah, that, that was a white space, man. I just felt like, yeah. you know, this is New York. The local stations aren't talking about this team like that. E- no. Even the, the stations that cover the team aren't talking no. about the team like no, that. they don't. Outside no. of just game days. And I said, no, you know, they, there's, there's still diehards out there. There's still people yeah. that, that bleed orange and blue. They'll go through that whole 17 and 65 season like we did game after game, night after night. Uh, 65 losses. <laughs> there, was, there, was, there wasn't much to talk about. But the people still came because they they wanted to be together and and bask in their misery together. Yeah, yeah. That's so right. that's why I love what we do. You know, just last night after Knicks Kings, we had a guy call in from from London, six thirty a.m. Yeah, six thirty a.m. Yeah. I'm always AM and by that. yeah, Australia. We have a big connection there. It's just all over the world, man. And that, and that's why I love about this platform because it's, it's truly uh, global in its connectivity. Yeah. And I, I'm going to give you and, and team credit. So now when we watch Knicks games, and I know the Knicks have always traveled well, have always done decently, but nothing like we're seeing today Yeah. of when they're playing in Orlando and it's like a Knicks home, home game. Right. When they're playing in D.C. and it's like a, a Knicks home game. When they're playing the Hawks and the, and the same thing. And you're seeing the jerseys, you're seeing the hats. I, I think that can be attributed to much of what you're doing to now expand just Nick fandom in, in general in such an immediate way for all of us. Yeah. It's just stunning, stunning change. Yeah, it, it's it's rewarding for sure. It's rewarding when you look on MSG and, and uh, they pan over in the crowd and someone's wearing a Knicks fan TV hat. So That's right. It's That's right. uh you know it's a testament to what we've built. Chuck is in there every night. He he's in he's in the live show before I'm even there, ready to go yeah. to start the show, that's, and, and he's interacting with Chuck the fans. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, it's it just it's just incredible, and that's what keeps me going. As you said, you got to be tired after last night's loss. I am, but uh, it's just a passion for you know for what we're building. It just keep, keeps me going, man. Fair. Fantastic. Uh, you know, I, I was up a good part of the way with you and JD. Um, I, did, did, I, I, I did dip off. Yeah. <laughs> you know, a bit and I looked at my phone and I'm like, you know, it's time for me to go. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, you know, it, it's so compelling that uh, what you do is so compelling that it doesn't matter if it's two o'clock in the morning. Yeah, absolutely, man. And uh, what, what's next for you, Bill? You know, you've you've accomplished so much in your journey and your career in so many facets of the arts, whether it's as a writer, it's in music, it's in it's in Hollywood, sports media. You know, you talk you talked about how much influence your father had on you. Uh, so, so what's next for you? Just trying to find the next gig, CP. <laughs> you know, try to find the uh, the the next one. Nelson mm-hmm. Nelson George and I are are working on a, a documentary project right now that's baseball oriented. He just did a magnificent job. He uh, produced and directed a documentary for HBO on Willie Mays. Okay, yes, yes, that's um, right. Yeah, 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 on Willie Mays. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, so we're following up uh, to together on that. I have another film that uh, I produced in partnership with with Gary Cohen and his company Triple Threat Television. Mm-hmm. They've produced about ten or eleven of the thirty for thirties mm-hmm. for ESPN. So we have uh, a film called Philly on Fire, which uh, covers what was the 1985 municipal bombing of the radical group move mm, uh, mm-hmm. you know for those who weren't around back then there, there was this point when uh, there was this group called move mm-hmm. um who had a a an alternate an alternative way of of life living in, in philadelphia that uh that may have disturbed uh, some of their neighbors mm-hmm. the neighbors complained to the city and the city tried uh, numerous ways to address uh, Move's occupancy in the, the West Philadelphia uh, neighborhood where they resided. And that culminated, unfortunately, in the city dropping an explosive uh, Move headquarters, which then incinerated mm-hmm. much of, of that West Philly neighborhood. So uh, we have a great documentary directed by Tommy Walker and Ross Hockrow. Uh, they also... Uh, directed the uh, Kaepernick in America documentary that that we released recently that folks can find on all sorts of uh, uh, platforms on demand, and we've been screening the uh, the Kaepernick film in various universities and colleges and schools across the nation to absolute fanfare and fantastic discussion 
about sports, race, law enforcement, Colin Kaepernick, the NFL, Donald Trump. Um, it's it's been a, a a good process for that, and we're going to continue on on projects like that. But hey, man, I I got to do everything I can to find projects so I can afford Knicks tickets. <laughs> you know, they're they're not what the, what they were. Uh, just to prep, yeah, for um for uh, our, our discussion. So I was looking in uh, in my archives. Mm. And uh, so I found what is this this ticket, you know, just holding it up here. Yep, so yep. this is from game two of the 1994 finals, the Knicks versus Houston. Yeah. This was the game before the OJ game. Okay, okay. I attended, you know, all of all of the games. Yeah. But this was ticket number two, seventy five dollars. Wow. And what section was that? Section one eighteen, uh, seat eleven. This would section be section one eighteen. Yeah, this would be like an eight hundred dollar ticket, yeah. probably more. Yeah, seventy five dollars. Yeah, well, in in this coming up uh, playoffs, because uh, I just one of my guys um, who's from the area as well uh, just texted me and said that the prices are through the roof. He just got his yeah. invoice for playoff tickets. That section is probably going to be between eight hundred to a thousand dollars. Yeah, Easy. yeah, man. Yeah, so I, you know, I'm lucky I was around. <laughs> When I was around, where I, you know, I I owned a company, you know, had a little bit of uh, of money, some cash, yeah. and could afford, yeah, a seventy five dollar ticket, yeah, for uh, the NBA Finals. That was for the finals. Incredible. Yeah, those man. are those are for, and again, that's that's game two. Yeah. Um, game three. I, yeah, I'm sitting there with you know <laughs> the woman who became my wife, Tanya, um, and um, you know, we're looking, we're watching the game. It's going towards halftime, and we're looking at the different screens in the suites in Madison's in Madison Square Garden mm-hmm. for for that game. Mm-hmm. I think it was June seventeenth, nineteen ninety four. Mm-hmm. So wait a minute, there's some white car that's <laughs> driving slow on? on a highway. What the heck is going on? So I go back to get my halftime ginger ale. Yeah, and I go in the bar, and you know people are watching TV. It's OJ. It's OJ. Oh so, my goodness! You know people can watch the 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 tape of uh, of that game you can watch mm-hmm. it on nba tv or you know wherever they show it at msg or watch it on online yeah and you'll see that as they begin that second half there's nobody in their seats because wow. we're all at the bar yeah you yeah. know trying to get close to tvs all outside by you know where you pick up the food court and everything trying to watch oj wow that's one of the profound nick moments Man, let me tell you, as a kid, I remember that night. And when they cut the game off to go yeah. to the OJ situation, I'm like, wait a minute. Wait. This is the NBA Finals. My team is here. We're trying to win a championship. And I didn't have cable at the time or anything. And I'm just a kid. I'm like, okay, maybe they put the game on Channel 9. Or maybe it's on Channel 11. So I'm flipping up and down from 2 to 11 for about an hour. Like, where is the game? I couldn't That's believe right. it, man. You know, nowadays it'll be on, you know, MSG two, three, four, five, or six. But That's right. I I was like, what happened to the game? Yeah, that that's right. And we didn't know that was happening because yeah. we're there in the arena, you know, and then it's back to uh to the game and watching uh you know Hakeem and Ewing battle. Man, that that was tough, man. Um just, just tough. And then we just saw, you know, Patrick Ewing was uh just let go by Georgetown, man. So Disappointing, yeah. man. Yeah, I I tried to watch pretty much, and because of being a Nick fan, mm-hmm. I think I watched almost every Georgetown game. Wow! During during his tenure, and you know it it, it was rough. the mm-hmm. The good years uh, were when he had uh, the backcourt that featured this young man, James Akinjo. I mm-hmm. I, I think it has a two way contract with somebody. Mm-hmm. And Mac and Mac McClung, yes, who yeah, was yeah. who won the, the uh, dunk slam contest. dunk contest yep. this year was actually for his first two years, he was under the tutelage of Patrick and did well. Mm. Yeah, it's unfortunate. You know, and, and that was one of the reasons why when, when a lot of Knicks fans were like, we need you in the coach. I don't want to see you in coaching the team, man. Yeah, because I, don't, yeah. I never want to see his his legacy tarnished again. Yeah, right? It took yeah. us a long time to get over the finger roll game and not bring the championship in 94 to, to bring him back, retire his jersey. Now we all love him. But to, you know, I didn't. I, I didn't want to see him lose as a coach with this team. Sure, sure. What about another ex Nick? Do you think they should have brought Mark Jackson back? <sighs> you know, I would have been okay with it. Prior to Tibbs, I would have been yeah. okay with bringing Mark Jackson in. Definitely. Yeah. I like Mark. 
I think he's caught a raw deal. Um, I'm not sure if he'll ever get back into the league now. They mm-hmm. did before J.B. Bickerstaff uh, was with Cleveland. I believe he did interview with, with the Cleveland Cavaliers, but that was like one interview. And he did interview with the Knicks when, when the yeah, he did that before track. Thibodeau was hired. Yeah, But... You know, I, I think that that ship is starting to sail, but I would have been on board prior to Tibbs with uh, with with Mark Jackson. Sure, you you would think with at least that initial job yeah. of developing Clay and and developing Steph that uh, you know no matter what went down at Golden State that it would still make him employable in in some other place. I, I guess we will see how that model works itself out with Ime Udoka. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll see how it goes, man. Uh, yeah. what, what's your final prediction for the Knicks this year? What, what do you think? Uh, how do you think this this all plays out? Yeah, I, let's hope that that Jalen is is healthy. You know, let's let's hope that uh, you know this foot uh, you know, doesn't bark at him. Yeah, you know, for the uh, the rest of, of the season because you know I don't know what the prospects are without him. Uh, I, Amen. You know, just rewinding the tape a bit to last summer when folks were questioning that deal of of Leon and uh, and management going mm-hmm. after him. I said, you know, anyone who watched, and maybe it's because I watch a ton of Big East basketball, mm-hmm. um, but anybody who watched this kid play for Villanova saw that he has that special something. Yeah, yeah. Sure, you know, his height can be of question, but there are just certain properties that a winner possesses that you can see it's incredibly intangible. A Supreme Court justice once said about pornography, I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. <laughs> right. Well, same thing with winners. Yeah. Yeah. That, you know, these are things that, you know, can't really determine through analytics mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. there there are intangibles. True, to winning true. that includes psychology, personality, heart, you know, all sorts of things. And and Jalen Brunson absolutely brings that every single game. And it now has reverberated throughout the the rest of the roster. Yeah. Uh also got to give kudos to Jay Wright. You know, mm-hmm. he clearly has a formula there, that, as we see now with with Josh Hart and what uh with Miles Bridges. Yeah, Mikal Bridges. With, that's yeah, yeah, they all have that I, DNA. With Mikal Bridges. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they, yeah, they, yeah. That's something going on uh, that, that Jay Wright should have bottled. Uh, I'm telling you, man, it's so noticeable with, with Villanova. I always say this. You saw it with Brunson, Mikal Bridges. They have Dante DiVincenzo, who's there with yeah, the Warriors. Who's doing very well. yeah. Mikal Bridges now, he's starting to break out. Josh Hart on, on this Nick team. They just come with with a certain floor where you just know that these guys from day one they're going to be ready to play. Yeah. They, they're yeah, re- yeah. they're so, ready to play from day one. Yeah. So, so we have, uh, we have now full benefit of that. So yeah, I'm, I remain hopeful. This has been a, a great season to experience, to, uh, to come back from what happened last year. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. And now to, to be where we're at today as, as a Nick fan, no, you got to be excited. And especially the year where we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of of that championship that uh 73 billy stephanie you know watch i had for you know also for show and tell so after the 73 um uh win mm-hmm. there was a quickie book put out called crazy about the knicks okay that marv albert and a co-writer jim bina put together and i ran to the store as a le- as an 11 year old and bought this book i still have it obviously nice. to this day that that's cool, man. Did you did you read the book um, uh, uh, when the garden was eaten with with Harvey Aridin? Did you read that one? I, I I have not read that yet. Okay, that one was good. I mean, you know, from my perspective, not having come up in that yeah. time, just just getting the the just learning more about that team and how all the the pieces came together, all the characters came together. I, I thought it was well done. He's a he's a great writer, so I got to put that on the list. Yeah. Absolutely, man. Yeah. Uh, well, Bill, I, I definitely appreciate the time, all the gems, the, the stories that you told, man. As I said to start this this episode off, I, I really appreciate it, man. This is just, you know, this is a great conversation. It is CP, it is my honor. You know, you as my fellow Long Island brother <laughs> as, as well. So <laughs> proud of you. Um, and, you know, Knicks fan, completely dedicated to, to everything that, that you do now. I got to get my Knicks fan swag so I can sport it all over the place. Absolutely, man. Thanks again, and uh, let, let's do it again. I'll be looking out for some of the newer projects that, that you come out with and supporting as well. Very good. Thank you. <laughs>